Lanciamola, ok, here we are. Uh, I will start giving you some, uh, just saying a few words on the project, so you have uh, a clear picture of who we are and what we are doing. Uh, as I was saying, uh, we are four partners, uh, Istituto Sturzo from Italy, and then we have the APP from France, who is really leading uh, the project. And then we have, uh, we have Kai from Portugal, and uh, we have the University of Loughborough from the UK. I won't go into the details because they are here and they will explain to you what they are doing and how they are related to culture and arts because of course we are all related somehow uh, to culture and arts. As I was saying, uh, the project is really focused on culture and cultural competence, so it's our ambition is a little bit to enable the creativity of each person to emerge and then use this kind of creativity also as a tool for social uh, cohesion and in order to develop also other competencies. This is something that we are often already doing uh, without being aware of what we are doing and of the, of the whole process. And this is why we want to promote this kind of reflection today. So in the first part of our project, we already worked on the, on the state of the art uh, and we, will try, we tried to understand what are the characteristics cultural competencies and therefore what are the challenges of our, of our project. Um, let me uh, remind, uh, remind you that cultural competencies are of course part of the, of the European framework of key competence. competencies. We uh, call it the eight competence, uh, so it's related to cultural sensitivity, cultural expression, but we know that the, the definition is really broad, it's really wide and this makes it also more difficult probably to understand it. Um, but we also consider that they are really crucial, so the European framework would be incomplete if this dimension would be not considered as the others at the same, at the same level as, as the others. But of course, uh, there is a, really a richness uh, in the cultural competencies. Why? Uh, because they are complex, uh, so they can assume different forms. Uh, we can talk about culture, as I was saying, as a mean of social inclusion, but also as individual expression, as openness to others, as a bridge between people, intercultural dialogue. Uh, we can also uh, think about the richness of our local cultural traditions, 
uh, or uh, about the language of arts and creativity. Uh, it is also a transversal competence because it is often present in other skills. Uh, for example, creativity can be also used to acquire other competencies, uh, becoming really a tool uh, for, um, in the learning process. Uh, and then uh, we know that uh, the cultural competencies are usually acquired more in an informal or non-formal context. Uh, and they are, of course, crucial not only for the professional uh, for the professional life, but especially, we believe, for our personal development and our social life. Uh, so this is to sum up a little bit why uh, we consider the, um, the cultural competencies and culture so crucial uh, for, uh, for the European framework um, of competencies. Uh, but at the same time, I think that this is why uh, we have to face so many challenges. Uh, so in our state of art, we underlined very well how uh, the cultural competencies are over, often overlooked or underestimated. And we were trying to understand why, so the reason behind this. Uh, we believe that this is perhaps, first of all, related to the fact that, uh, that uh, it's difficult to identify it as a specific competence. As I was saying, the definition is really wider and can be uh, applied to so many different forms uh, and situations, uh, it includes several dimensions, and uh, is very much closer to the individual uh, inclinations than the others. Uh, in addition, it's sometimes difficult to translate this kind of competence into something that can be seen as useful uh, for, uh, the professional, for, le for the professional level, uh, for positioning ourselves in the job market. Uh, so this reflects a little bit the dilemma uh, which sees the competencies caught between uh, an utilitarian and economic logic on one hand, and on the other hand, um, there is this uh, more human uh, dimension which is really based on the singularity of the, of the individual. Uh, then, of course, um, uh, we believe that is often underestimated how powerful our cultural competence also as a tool, as I was saying, also to promote citizenship, uh, to use art and creativity uh, to, acquire, to acquire new competencies. Uh, we often forget, for instance, that cultural tradition rooted in a territory represent also their identities. We often don't speak about culture in the individual sphere. So, uh, for instance, enjoying a piece of art which can really be empowerful and enrich ourselves. And I think that being here today in Rome in this wonderful palace already gives us an idea of what it means enjoying uh, cultural, uh, culture and, art, uh, and arts. And finally, uh, we also uh, sometimes neglect the fact that the professional, that culture can also be seen as a professional sector. And here a lot has been changing in the last years. So of course there is also this need to adapt our skills, our competencies to a cultural sector which is really uh, changing uh, day by day. And this is of course, uh, this can be applied to Istituto Luigi Sturzo, which is uh, a cultural institute dealing uh, with a cultural heritage. And again, based in a country like Italy where really culture and arts are at, at the core of our, of our identity. Uh, so this leads uh, a little bit to the challenges of cultural competencies, uh, which are all challenges related to the fact that cultural competencies and culture can be seen uh, as such a complex uh, um, uh, picture. Um, so as I was saying, they are not really technical competencies. They are, we are really working more on a human dimension. And this is why we believe that we need to design and adapt um, the ways we value, we recognize, uh, we uh, make people aware of this kind of competencies um, because they are transversal, uh, they are fluid, uh, they are acquired in an informal and non-formal context, but at the same time because they are really so crucial for, our, for ourselves on different levels. And this is why, for instance, we tried in our uh, different experience to uh, use uh, different methodologies uh, reflexive methodologies such as uh, the mentoring, uh, the storytelling, uh, the, the digital storytelling, uh, because we believe that people need to uh, use these kind of tools in order to uh, become aware of the competencies they have and uh, of the value of culture in their, in their life. 
So we uh, are going to um, address these kind of challenges through uh, core participatory action research. This is what we are doing at the moment. So we are really in the process of developing core uh, action researches in our countries. Uh, so we have different, um, uh, different projects uh, applied uh, in Italy, Portugal, um, uh, France, and, and, and UK. UK. And here we really uh, want uh, to address the issue on different levels. Uh, so uh, we are working uh, on uh, the, the trainees. Uh, and then uh, here we want really uh, to let emerge their creativity, which can then be used in order to engage other people and as a tool of social cohesion. Uh, we are working at the meso level. Uh, so we are working with a professional professionals engage in the cultural sectors. And we want also to work uh, at the macro level, so with the local stakeholder organization. And here, uh, really, the ambition is to um, think about a new uh, educational and pedagogical tool which can be used for uh, uh, trainers, facilitators working in the cultural sector. And yesterday, we were discussing how we should call them. For the moment, we are thinking about cultural developers, but then if you have some suggestions on that, <laughs> feel free to approach us maybe later. Uh, at the end, uh, we will have uh, a couple of documents uh, of publications, uh, trying uh, to give uh, some recommendations also in order to understand how um, the trainer uh, could be trained uh, and become a cultural developer. And then we will give you uh, a toolbox uh, with some examples based on our experience and the lessons we, we, are, we are learning. Um, so uh, we are really in the process um, and I will end here. Uh, I don't want to take too much time. I will give the floor to my colleagues. Um, but uh, of course then uh, we would be happy also to listen uh, your feedback and, uh, and uh, to start and engage a conversation with you on, on this. And now I, I would like to give the floor to Isabel Salvi, uh, who is the head of uh, research and development project at uh, APP, uh, l'Association pour la promotion du label APAP. Um, she will explain exactly uh, what do we mean by the label uh, APAP. And uh, thank you so much, Isabel. She is coordinating the whole project. So thank you for, for your work and for promoting actually uh, this, this reflection. Thank you, Isabel. A presentation, uh, a short presentation of who we are. So uh, first, uh, APAP, uh, so means Association for the Promotion of the APP Label. Uh, and APP means workshop, so this is atelier in French, for personalized pedagogy. So therefore, APAP is not an institution, but a label governed by the APAP. So uh, the APAP uh, is at the head um, of a national network of 110 training structures who adhere to the APP label. The APP label has always mobilized in the fight against exclusions and on the main challenges of training and social innovation. The APP label is governed by specification that set out the fundamentals and the values of the APP learning organization. It has already been 30 years uh, since this training model was born, bearer of a certain vision of training. So today, more than three million of learners have performed a training pass according to APP principles. Uh, so the APP training modalities are based on the concept of accompanied self-training, which is a pedagogic formula of a training of oneself, by oneself, but also with others that is performed in a learning ecosystem to support the development of competencies of autonomy and creativity. And this is the APP effect. It makes people happy. We realized that uh, at the heart of the model, it was indeed a process of transformation of people that was at stake. So why does it work? In the APP, trainers are 
concentrate their art and talents to propose, invent, articulate pad pedagogical modalities adapted to each learner. So APPs are experienced by learners as places of life and fulfillment. The model leaves a large place to informal situations because it is organized in an open system. In brief, we could say that the APP training model is a pedagogy of the creativity, the socialization, and the personal development. And that APPs are places where it is actively practiced, listening, empathy, tolerance, and awareness of the common good. A learner who comes to do a refresher in mathematics, for example, will automatically develop a full set of soft skills which relate to significant changes in behavior and attitudes, such as the development of a better communication and relationships with others, curiosity, critical thinking, but also the development of self-esteem, the desire to learn and to take initiatives. We have found that these sometimes existential transformations contribute greatly to strengthening the empowerment, the capacity of adaptation, and the development of the, in the person of a social and cultural life. So, but the problem so far was that all these manifestations of success were remaining invisible out of the sphere of the APP uh, for lack of evidence. Uh, that's why in 2015, APAP embarked on a major uh, action research project to understand what was at work concretely in the APP training model. Our challenge was to figure out how to formalize such a process of transformation of learners and therefore make visible such invisible transformation, but without falling into the trap of formatting. So our work led to the development and the registration of the APP certification called Apprenant Agile, which is Agile, uh, um, Agile Learner. This certification is of a new kind because it is based on evaluation by evidence. It has given the opportunity to completely re-examine practices of competence assessment, and since 2018, we have observed in the APP network a double movement of transformation, both of learners and uh, 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 sorry, both of learners and uh, this is not the right one. This is ah, yes, it's missing something. Um, uh, of both of learners and APP teams. And Apprenant Agile is therefore a formal process of recognition and validation of experience focused on transversal skills. So the certification process is built on three stages representative of a process of level up in recognition during which digital badges are validated by the learner all along the training path. Five APP digital badges have been created. Badges contain file of evidence, crystallizing the formalization of learning outcomes. The badge Apprenant Agile is the certification. It recognizes the ability to assert one's abilities to learn and adapt. It includes a reflexive synthesis of the entire path. So the, cha the challenge is to accompany people to adopt a reflexive thought on action to become actor of their own recognition. During a set of collective workshops and individual meetings, APP teams accompany learners in the reflection on the experience, allowing them to build links between formal knowledge, action knowledge, and existential knowledge. It is a whole process during which the learner identifies, recognizes, values, becomes aware and reveals, in the photographic sense, his soft skills. He learns to talk about it to others, but also as well to, as to himself, to put words on these competencies and to make connections with situations where he mobilizes them. The objective of this approach is also to open the different space-time, to create meaning 
by articulating the different personal, social, professional times of life in training, at work, and individual or collective activities. The collective aspect of the workshops to practice uh, reflexivity places the group at the service of individuals to advance individually with and by others and promote the development of collective intelligence. To embark on a practice of evaluation by evidence is to address the fundamental question of the transfer of acquired experience. The proof is what makes visible the context in which the action or activity was located, but it is also what makes visible the experience of the bearer of the evidence. With the proof, the learner makes visible the learnings that he has integrated and that he is consequently able to reproduce. The badge then becomes the symbol of this transfer. So our development in, um, with Apprenant Agile uh, were focused actually on the fifth European key competence dedicated to social and personal skills and the ability to learn to learn. Now with Hard Connection, we want to focusing on the eighth European key competence dedicated to cultural sensitivity and expression to value also practices of the APPs on their cultural territories where they act and intervene to make sure nobody is left aside. So the APAP action research will therefore rely on the territorial anchoring of its network together with the latest development under the Apprenant Agile certification process. Two APP teams in Barbezieux and in Market Les Lille are more specifically committed to experiment two kinds of cultural projects together with learners, artists, and local stakeholders. We will try to figure out how it is possible to think outside the box, to renew training approaches and modalities, making culture one of the pillars of action and a lever for the development of individual and collective skills in the service of social cohesion. So now I have pleasure to leave the voice uh, to our partner from Rosborough University in the UK, who we are missing a lot <laughs> because she should have been with us in Roma. So Antonia Ligori, she's senior lecturer in applied storytelling from School of Design and Creative Arts. Thank you, thank you, Isabel. Thank you. And uh, actually, I'm here with a um, fantastic group of um, younger researchers uh, who are uh, sharing the joy of not being in Rome with uh, I want to start Karen's birthday, and uh, we want to celebrate, celebrate Karen's birthday in Rome, but we actually... <laughs> so there is a, a reason why I'm doing this, uh, which is, of course, because I, I love Karen and, uh, uh, and I love celebrating people, but also because this is an example of the way in which we approach uh, our research and we, we try to build our, what we call LAFRA family. Uh, at LAFRA University, actually, we really value people and we really value the role of people, not only in research, but as, a, as members of a large, larger community. Um, one of the reasons why I think uh, LAFRA University, and in particular our research group that is called the Storytelling Academy, is involved in this project is actually because we are perceived and we are believed to be expert in storytelling and in particular applied storytelling that of course is a research methodology which can be useful uh, for the specific outcomes and objectives of the project and actually i love your words uh, you, what you just said isabel when you said culture should be the pillar of action because actually this is what we try to do every time we start a new research project so LAFRA, LAFRA University is a research intensive university. That means that the majority of the time that academics spend um, during the day is around research, or in theory should be around research. And then there is, of course, there is teaching and what we call enterprise. Uh, actually, this specific project is for us within under the umbrella of the enterprise activity. That sounds a strange um, sort of definition, but these are the activities that we run uh, as a parallel to research 
to make sure that our research is long lasting and has an impact in society. So all our European collaborations and in particular those strategic, strategic partnerships and knowledge exchange partnerships, they are all about making sure that the work we do in research in developing and adapting and expanding this community engagement tool that we call digital storytelling is actually owned by the people we work with. So um, in particular, what we do is making sure that every time we start a research project or a community-led project actually doesn't end with the end of the project. And therefore, our obje objective is to make sure that the methodology we apply is tailored to the context in which we work in a way that is then self-sustainable and uh, of course self-sufficient even when the academics and the researchers are no longer uh, engaging with the community with whom we are working during the research project, which is something very, very important to us. Uh, so Lafra, if you think about, uh, as you can guess from my accent, I'm Italian, by the way. But anyway, uh, when I moved to, to the UK, I didn't know where Lafra was, but if you think about the map of England, this is exactly in the middle. And it's not far from Leicester and Nottingham. Uh, it's um, one of the best um, universities in the UK. It was ranked as the best university in the UK in 2019. This year, our department for art and design is the best in the UK. So we love ranking. Uh, but <laughs> at least uh, by definition, we, we tend to, 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 to add those descriptors uh, when we talk about our university. Uh, but to give you an idea of the type of environment, as I was saying at the very beginning, we, you know, joking around Karen's birthday, we really value people and, uh, and we talk about our community of academic students and researchers as the Lafra family. So I, I just want to share with you a little video to give you an idea of the campus uh, in which we work, which is the, one of the largest campus uh, in, uh, in, um, in Europe uh, as a, as a one-sided campus. So I think that um, the campus probably is larger than the city, the town it, itself. So if you want to play the video.
So this wasn't the usual celebratory video that we do every year, because of course we had the pandemic last year, so it was a bit different in the spirit and the tone of the, of the sort of images they've been sharing. But this was just to give you an idea. So um, the Lafra community is very strong and uh, is um, uh, in particular the, the STEM disciplines, the STEM side of campus uh, is very well known worldwide and the sport uh, dis related disciplines as well as the, but as I said earlier, I was joking about we love ranking. It, it's not that the matter uh, matters actually, but there is one thing that I really enjoy about ranking that is um, one of the criteria for measuring the research excellence in, in UK is impact. Uh, and impact is, uh, is actually what we want to achieve through our research. And in the latest submission for the REF, that is the Research Excellence Framework, our unit and our research group was able to actually submit impact case studies linked to the digital storytelling projects, which are all addressing uh, something that I would align with the UN Sustainable Goals, just to give you an idea. We are mainly involved, even if we are based in the School of the Arts and Design, uh, sorry, design and creative arts. Uh, we, we tend to work in transdisciplinary projects. That means that we work with other colleagues across different disciplines, uh, and taking the lead on what we call community engagement or participatory research or action research. Uh, just to, again, I was jotting down some words when Loredana was uh, talking at the very beginning of this first panel. Uh, and there is something she said about enjoying culture. Uh, I think that is something that resonates with our approach because enjoying, I mean, what we do, the work, why storytelling, why digital storytelling in education, for instance, or to, to enhance soft skills or to increase cultural awareness, because we strongly believe in the power of emotions and how emotions could make learning long lasting and how emotions could help us frame ideas and, uh, and make those ideas uh, more valued uh, and uh, understood and, and felt and owned by the community we work with. So again, keywords used by Loredana that we, that resonates our work, of course, cultural values, social inclusion. And then you said something around complexity. Complex challenges are actually, actually our daily bread. And again, storytelling, stories in general, they, they sound simple sometimes, but they actually are um, a summary and a, a sort of emanation of a very complex um, set of information that we, we tend to simplify in a narrative form, which actually can unlock very complex uh, ideas. And, uh, and actually the use of storytelling in particular in the work we are doing for the art connection work is mainly to dismantle those barriers and knowledge hierarchies that often exist when academia uh, encounters other types of words and other types of environments. I think there was another video that we made in, um, uh, in our slides. Uh, I can't see the slide now on our Zoom screen, but there was another video in the slide that is just a slideshow of, few, of a few images and um, uh, bits of footage that was taken during our research projects. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, a taste of the type of work we do. Uh, very often we've been working on climate change, mental health, as I said, societal challenges. Uh, and we've got strong partnerships with wide different types of institutions from the Smithsonian Institution, the largest museum institution in the world, to NGOs like Hope Crazes in Kenya. So you will see all those images combined together just to give you an idea of the type of stakeholders we work with. Actually, the, they work with us because we want them to actually take a lead in the type of research we do.
just to close up this short introduction on our research and um, what we do, uh, there should be another slide with a few lines about the uh, action research projects that we are running as part of the, this particular EU-funded project, Art Connection. Uh, so the plan uh, is to work with um, a group of third-year drama students uh, who are involved in one of our modules that is called Theatre in the Community. And the idea is to use a variety of storytelling te techniques as part of the development of that coursework uh, to engage the local community in Lafra and explore ideas around inclusion. Uh, in Lafra, there is a bit of a um, sort of tension because Lafra is a quite um, a white and rural community that suddenly in October, when all the students are academic, they are on campus, becomes very diverse and multicultural. So we are trying to uh, understand those tensions between the local community and the students or academic community and using food as a way of facilitating conversations and sharing memories and stories and traditions and making sure that there is mutual understanding. Um, the, the idea is for them to actually work on soundscapes uh, so that they are actually create an audio material, a collection of audio materials, working in groups uh, with some snippets of sounds from the market or the park, interviews, uh, so combining sound and narrative to create a soundscape around social inclusion and food within the Lafra community to explore, as we said, those tensions between local communities and the newcomers for different reasons. Um, the second uh, project we are running is, uh, is a proper digital storytelling project and the idea is to train local activists in Birmingham uh, because in Birmingham there is another tension. So very often digital storytelling is used as a way of uh, understanding conflicts and trying to solve those conflicts and exploring dilemmas by uh, sharing ideas but not driven by ideas and concepts but driven by stories and personal perspectives so the idea is to this conflict in birmingham is in a specific area in this giant city where there is an existing reservoir there is an artificial lake uh, that is um, a place for well-being for the local community and there is a plan from the local council to build um, a large number of new houses so the local community now they are coming together to actually create some, through creativity, some form of activism. This is why I was loving what you said, uh, Isabel, when you said culture as a pillar for action. Uh, so the idea is for us then to train them so that they become independent in creating digital story with stories with their own local, different local groups. Uh, they are planning to work with young people, with elderly in care homes, local dwellers and um, uh, people enjoying the, the space and the reservoir uh, to make sure that those story, uh, stories are somehow uh, informing the future plans at council level in the, in, in the city of Birmingham. So these are the two uh, sides of our, of our research, action research, working with different groups, a group of students, drama students, for them creativity is their, uh, you know, their daily language and group of local communities who will use and will explore those tools uh, that we tend to use for digital storytelling activities to actually unlock uh, those complex ideas and those, um, let's say, personal needs uh, in enjoying uh, the, 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 the space and the park around the reservoir. So that's just a very quick introduction of what we are planning to do and what we already started to do. And now I will actually leave the floor to my dear colleague and friend from Lisbon, Helga Luis Santos, uh, that is uh, from CAI, CAI from Lisbon, is the director of Street Work Training Institute and also an international trainer on street work education and on culture and social cohesion. everybody and um, well I start perhaps with um, a very quickly uh, action um, um, my mail is kai at kai.org.pt it's important to put the mail in your notes because you are invited during this uh, moment from this moment till the end of this session 
to send me a photo or a, um, a statement about how, is, how the culture is important as skill. And perhaps if you don't like this, why it will be very important in 20 years ahead, in the future, okay? Send me kai at kai.org.pt. It's a very nice action during my boring uh, moment of speech in uh, English with uh, lots of Portuguese sentences, okay? Well, I introduce myself, I'm Elder, and I, uh, my colleague of the team is Grasa, is in the audience to um, look at you, if you do or not the action. Well, what is CHI? CHI is an organization of uh, trainers and uh, social um, uh, learners and uh, uh, people that come from different backgrounds uh, because we like a lot mix people and uh, try to discuss with uh, each one uh, several topics. And of course, if it's an ONG, uh, NGO, uh, and they operate, uh, it, it operates uh, in the field of the youth and the adult education. It's like to have uh, some, you know, some boundaries uh, in order to give you a, a, um, a map of our um, uh, work. Uh, our work is in the participatory way. Participatory means uh, this uh, conference is very participative because we have uh, lots of people um, quiet in front of us. It's very participative. I like this kind of participation a lot. Um, more if it's um, youngsters. Uh, if he's youngsters and he's quiet as you, I'm, uh, I love it. Uh, but of course not. In Kai, we like a lot the participation, but the active participation. Uh, if you have some references in terms of participation, we used to be in the top of the ladder of Arnstein, is a conceptualist of this concept of participation. I give you the tip in the end, uh, doing networking in the in the um, around the coffees, and so I can give you some uh, tips about that. Uh, and research action projects, because why? Because we like a lot theory, because some of us coming from the university or academia um, setting, that means um, it's very well, it's very nice to be, to have um, a theoretical work. But because we have also petitioners, the petitioners start to discuss with academics about which is more valuable the evidence base from the academy or the practice base of, from them. That's why a very nice struggle between theory and practice, and as you know, in the end, uh, we uh, try to do the consensus, and for us it's so important the evidence base, as important is the experience base. And that's why uh, research action, research projects, is always a very nice moment to put in practice that. But, we don't have only theory and practice. We must act. And act is a question of to be politic, to be active citizen. That's why for uh, our organization, we have three axes. The theoretical, the action, the practice, but also the politics. The politics means not to be candidate <laughs> to the next government because uh, I'm too old for that and uh, my, uh, my life have lots of things uh, that we um, explore in the social uh, networks and avoid lots of votes, that's why I don't put there. But still, it's very important to be, to advocate. Not advocate in name of the others, but also advocate our points of view. And that's why these three pillars are very important. Some a very nice discussion. We have uh, education. Uh, we operate in education both um, formal or non formal, but we have in the last three, day, uh, three years, we have a very special 
um, focus in the uh, informal education because we seems me that in the future informal education is a very nice mind setting where we can explore the next skills for some of you of course i'm not there i'm in trip in to mars but uh, then i re <laughs> i return back in the next century community development Com community development is another axis of our action and is based on projects uh, um, carried out by the community and uh, uh, salutes with um, uh, practice with the community. It's very important, this engagement. Youth uh, and adult activation. We have, in this moment, um, we work a lot with uh, youth people and adult youth people um, with the uh, um, needs of activation because they are a little bit lost. A lot of promises. If you, if you have a diploma, you have a job. Lots of, um, um, you know, uh, moments of, um, of hope, but arriving in the end of the, the trainings, uh, uh, in the end of the diplomas, they have the diploma, but they don't have jobs and they don't have anything to do. Oh, yes, they have very, lots of things to do, but it's uh, illegal, immoral, or become fat. It's like me. I like the illegal, the immoral, and I, I'm fat, <laughs> as you see. Um, uh, that's, that's why activation is very nice and very important. And activation is not to give them uh, injections of citizenship. No, it's not that. But it's to discuss with them, to raise with them not only problems, but also solutions for these problems. And this not. Be careful, it's not to start with the wanda uh, baguette, wanda, uh, magic wanda, to do an um, entrepreneurship um, learning process to, for to become all entrepreneurs. But because in the end, before that, we uh, were uh, entrepreneurs already. That's why we must improve them but active them, but not give them um, sessions of entrepreneurship. Intercultural education is linked with art connection. As you see, culture today, it's, uh, it's uh, uh, as uh, my colleague uh, Loredana said, is a crucial uh, um, mindset uh, where, we can, uh, where we can live together and perhaps in the well-being, but uh, in our days, culture is one of the, as a, an impact, and this impact is very negative, because m some of us in our society, we judge in terms of culture, and this judgment is very negative, is to avoid the other, is to avoid the backgrounds, is, uh, to impose some, uh, in some way uh, our culture um, uh, point of view or our cultural uh, uh, skills, if you want. That's why the misuse of culture also improve a lot of uh, problems for the social cohesion. And that's why we are very interesting in edu intercultural education. We skipped the, 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 the old concept that we had, it's multicultural education. Why? Because multicultural is like you. You are here, very quiet, but everyone has an opinion about me, and, but you don't dare to discuss that with me. Or perhaps because you are against, or because you, you don't agree with me, because I'm boring, and so and so. That's why multicultural put us on the room, but nothing is created. Why? Because each one has it is or her culture. For us, the important is not to put together, it's to put together and interact. 
interact, uh, interaction is a very important uh, moment. Art education, of course, and social street work, which, which is social street work. Social street work because the street exists, because the street is the public space, sometimes private, sometimes public, and it depends a lot of the politics today. The politicians uh, start to privatize the, 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 the public space, but the couples also need to privatize sometimes the public space in a very uh, private space. What for, or what we can do that is go to the encounter of the people on the streets. In Italy, some of the colleagues uh, named that Educatore di strada, uh, some of the teams uh, named that, uh, that uh, methodology. Uh, and for what? For build up a real uh, interpersonal relationship. It's not always the same. Everything in our life is based on an interpersonal relationship that became a very important relationship because we start to have confidence with the other. That means we. Um, starts with the uh, with uh, interrelation uh, interpersonal uh, relationship but we finished in a trust relationship and when we arrive in the trust relationship we have the conditions to start the educative relationship that means the educative that means to ask to put questions it's not to tell them how you can do that no it's to listen to them it's very different. It's not, it's not like us in this room, of course. Um, and then we start to foster competences and skills. And uh, how to go to the encounter of the people on street situation. That's why we, in CAI and in the Street Work Training Institute, is uh, uh, a branch of an international network of street work projects, street work national representatives, uh, we discuss that on these two, uh, two organizations. One, a national level, CHI, and Street Work Training Institute in a worldwide uh, um, setting. Uh, I show now a little video done by uh, me and um, by us from Portugal and the colleagues of Mexico about which is um, um, street, social street work methodology. Well, now I speak a little bit uh, about our research action project about um, in our field based on the model of um, which is uh, art education for us. Art education for us um, is a way to, to foster the cultural competences 
and the CHI model is to use art education in both ways. One is a learning process, means uh, is uh, um, uh, a way that we uh, can start to uh, learn and develop other skills, and another one is using that as a learning tool. Uh, most of our colleagues from the street uh, are, are uh, in this path, uh, using a lot the, um, the uh, tools of art education in order to start the interpersonal relationship and then to uh, uh, achieve the uh, trust relationship. But we uh, also have a lot of uh, youngsters and uh, uh, youth adults that the learning, the, this, using these tools, start a learning process uh, by doing, by learning, uh, by doing and learning to learn other skills that they have and they are somewhere um, either in their mindset. Uh, art for us, it's not only to see, to hear, to taste and smell and touch, but because we see, we can understand. And this is the very important path uh, uh, further, path a uh, go further, is to see, but to see in in a, a way that I try to understand the other, the environment and my social group, of course. That means is with this that we try to have dreams, feelings, thinkings, emotions and imagination. We open mind, we open doing and sharing this process. And we develop not only the cognitive intelligence, but also the emotional intelligence. And for us, uh, keep, that idea, uh, keep that idea of em emotional uh, uh, skills, because emotion uh, um, uh, process, it could be one of the keys for, for foreseeing the new skills in the future. In 20 years, perhaps, the uh, in emotional intelligence could be one of the most important tools to develop in our target populations. With that, with speaking about dreams, feelings, thinking, emotions and imagination, we can to like explore the creativity and of course the creativity not only to build up, but the creativity in the process of critical thinking that, uh, uh, that goes to, to innovation innovation and social change. This is the key of our uh, process of learning, is to produce in the future changes and social innovation. Culture is appear here as an emancipatory way to, the, to build up the social cohesion. This is the, the, the mindset of our research action. And then I can uh, discuss with you, of course, in the coffee break time, I can discuss a little bit more these aspects. Our uh, Art Connection Action Research is based on these three actors that are present in this uh, field, means target population, educators or uh, ed cultural developers, and it doesn't matter. And the trainers of these developers try to find, in discussion, in focus group, try to find which are the skills that a, a cultural developer must have in the future in order to um, raise more social skills in accordance with the eighth competency. I think it's everything I give you the floor. Thank you very much. Don't forget, I evaluate you if you don't send me your picture, your statement, everything you want, you can send me by kai at kai.r.pt. Don't forget that. Mm, I return back. Thank you so much, Helder. <laughs> I'm sure that they will write you something about culture.
Um, as we are running a little bit late, and it's always like this when we start talking, can't hear. Can you hear? No. No. We can. Ah, they cannot hear us. Non ci sentono loro. Ecco, adesso vi sentiamo. Ecco, adesso sentite. Perfetto. Grazie. <laughs> so you know everything about Istituto Ligis Turso, but still, it's nice if you can listen to me as well. Uh, so we are a cultural foundation which is really committed to the um, preservation and the enhancement uh, of our rich cultural heritage. Uh, this means that culture for us, uh, it's really uh, the core identity, uh, is the core identity of our institute and we are convinced that culture is an asset for all and should be an asset for all, and it has a value which citizens uh, should enjoy. And this is, uh, let's say, a guiding principle for, our, for all our activities. Uh, we were founded in 1951, and uh, since then we've been engaged in a process of renewal, so of course uh, we um, tried uh, to reach a wider, wider public, and we can say that we were among the first uh, cultural institutions uh, working in order to open, really, uh, the country's cultural heritage to the general public. Uh, so, um, we are developing today's uh, different activities, uh, but I would say that since uh, the beginning, we are working on two pillars. The first one is really uh, related to our cultural heritage, is our core activity, uh, and it's a cultural heritage which tells the history of the 20th century, uh, the history uh, in Italy, but also in Europe, and in terms of international relations, of course. And then we have a second line of activity which aims at contributing to keep alive this memory, which, we, which means also starting from our cultural heritage, uh, trying to contribute to the most recent debates, providing tools to interpret uh, the present, the transformation, the challenges of nowadays, our societies, and also uh, we are trying to engage people and make our heritage, as I was saying, more accessible to the wider public, so really everyone can enjoy uh, our heritage. Uh, this means also, of course, strengthening our cultural offer, the fruition of our heritage uh, through different dissemination uh, tools, also trying to find innovative ways uh, to, tell, uh, to tell our story and our heritage. Uh, when uh, we speak about the cultural heritage, uh, what am I talking about? I was uh, planning to show you uh, a short video, but since you are mo most of you are here in the, in, uh, the Perin del Vaga room, uh, I will just encourage you to uh, have a short walk after, after the conference uh, and just see uh, with your own eyes uh, what we are and what we are doing. Uh, so we, uh, we hold uh, a very important, a very rich documentary heritage, uh, which is our historical archive. Uh, this is composed of 117 collections, um, which can be translated, uh, if you want to have really a picture of this, uh, into two kilometers of documentation. Uh, these are not only papers, but also posters, photographs, audio files, films, and then we have a unique rare book collection, 140,000 uh, volumes and 60 periodicals. And then everything is uh, preserved in this, um, in this, uh, um, in this palace, uh, Palazzo Baldassini, uh, which is a building uh, of the 16th century. Uh, so we usually say that uh, uh, we are in a building of the 16th century, preserving the history of the 20th century. And uh, in, this, um, in this palazzo, Palazzo Baldassini, uh, we also have frescoes uh, from Raffaello School. Uh, here you, you can see some fresco from uh, Perin del Vaga. Uh, and of course, this was um, built during the uh, Italian Renaissance. Uh, 
uh, and you know that this was really a period uh, where Italy was at the center of an intellectual revolution, and this had a big impact also in terms of innovation in the artistic and arch architectural field. So of course, the, all of this is uh, it's our cultural heritage. And then, uh, what is our role as a cultural institute nowadays? Of course, we are facing many challenges, and as you probably know, because we are familiar with our sector, uh, we, uh, let's say, the cultural institutes in the, in the last years um, had uh, to face um, a kind of crisis uh, and had to embark into some kind of renewal, rethinking their activities and how they are engaging uh, with the public. Um, and then we really invested a lot of efforts, a lot of energies uh, in the idea that cultural activities can be a fundamental resource for overcoming also moments of difficulties like the one we are, we've, we are still experiencing with the COVID pandemic. And when I say uh, cultural activity, I really mean it in the broadest way, also as historical awareness of our own identity, uh, relationship with other cultural and political subjects, uh, as an offer of civil and political, and political training. Um, so cultural skills and culture um, as a tool of social inclusion and, and an active also active citizenship are really at the core of our activities in different ways. So for instance, we developed different uh, projects uh, promoting active civic, civic citizenship and advocating uh, for global citizenship and also uh, in order to make people more aware of their identity, of their roots, of our, our common history. Uh, this is something that, for instance, we are doing with, uh, also within a project called uh, Giving uh, Memories uh, a Future uh, with the volunteers um, from the Universal Civil Service. Uh, the Universal Civil Service is a social commitment, a project of active citizenship, and we are applying it to our cultural heritage. So we are connecting somehow citizenship, active citizenship, and culture. Uh, we are also developing new projects connecting culture, memory, territories, and personal growth. So for instance, we are creating multimedia journeys, uh, which allow people really with a, a strong narrative uh, to go into uh, historical events uh, through uh, images, sounds, uh, and this usually has a great emotional impact. Uh, then we developed different projects on cultural competencies, and uh, we tried also to understand how to adapt our competencies in order to work in such an environment in the cultural sector. And this is what, for instance, we are doing with um, uh, Loughborough University in the UK with another project which is called uh, Certify. Um, and uh, a little bit more about uh, our role in uh, the Art Connection project. As I was telling you uh, before, we are developing action research, uh, and this is what we are really doing at the moment, uh, also together with Eugenia Porro, uh, which is here in the audience. Uh, we are uh, targeting a group of young uh, volunteers of the civil service. They are working in four cultural institutes in Rome, so they are already engaged and already working on the cultural heritage, but we are trying to make the most out of the experience, and uh, we are trying to um, let them emerge their creativity. So they are going to work on the cultural heritage and then use some creative tools in order to communicate also to a wider public what they are learning throughout this uh, experience in terms of uh, awareness, consciousness, citizenship, the meaning of our community, of our values, of our history. Uh, this is something that uh, is uh, undergoing at the moment, so of course we are not ready to tell you the results of our research, uh, but I can already tell you that we are learning a lot from this experience. Uh, I will end it here, and of course we have the time then to go into the details if you want to discuss it later, also during, at the end of the conference. Uh, but please follow our activities, of course, on our uh, social media, our website, and then we have also a website for the project, Art Connection, so you can really follow all our activities there. And now I really thank you very much. I thank Elder, uh, Isabel, and Antonia uh, for being with us and uh, explain a little bit more um, uh, about their um, uh, experience. Uh, and now I would like to uh, start listening to you and, um, uh, and hear it 
uh, I could say that this is more participatory, so Helder <laughs> can be there and also listen and then give us a feedback. And uh, so I will uh, start now the second panel of our discussion. Uh, I will invite some uh, representatives of different associations and organizations based in Italy working on, uh, on culture and arts. Uh, they will alternate here on the stage. I will call it like a marathon of ideas, of perspectives on culture. And they will alternate because, of course, we cannot, we cannot have too many people here. So thank you very much, Helder and Isabel, again. And I will uh, ask Cristina da Milano in Pina Sodano to please join me here. Thank you, thank you so much. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. And let's start promoting uh, this kind of reflection on culture. And I ask Cristina da Milano uh, to start with uh, her contribution. Uh, Cristina, thank you so much for being here with us. Uh, Cristina is the president of ECOM, uh, the European Center for Cultural Organization and Management. Uh, we work actually together in different projects in the, in the past, and I hope we will do it again uh, soon. Uh, she's also the vice president and the board member of Culture Action Europe. Uh, she's speci specialized in, uh, in the field of museum education and communication uh, with a particular focus on uh, lifelong le learning and also culture as a tool for social integration. And this is why I would like to ask you, Christina, to give us really an overview on intercultural dialogue and culture as a tool for social integration. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you, you so Loredana. Much. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, so I don't move it. Thanks uh, to the Art Connection partners for the invitation. I'm always very happy when I can share my experience on this topic, which is obviously my, let's say, professional life, uh, more important topic. Um, I have a presentation and I hope I'll be able to move the slides forward. Yes, probably yes, let's see. Uh, Loredana Held, yeah. yes. this one, mm -mm. <laughs> nothing happens, and I keep on trying, mm. yes, well anyway I'll start by saying that ECOM is an association and also a limited company. We have a double uh, legal status, let's say. And the organization has been founded in 1995, meaning that it's 26 years old. And we basically uh, carry out activities which are research activities, training activities, and also consultancy activities in the field, yes in the field of cultural heritage and culture in broad terms. When I say cultural heritage, I mean tangible, intangible heritage and cultural activities as such. Um, what do we do in terms of intercultural dialogue and intercultural competences? We work a lot on building intercultural competences within the cultural field addressing training activities and capacity building activities to cultural professionals. And we do that within a theoretical framework. So we also, let's say, work on research and on theoretical frameworks, methodologies and tools, which we try to, let's say, tailor-make 
uh, in, a, in a, let's say, more specific way for the cultural field, which is a specific uh, kind of environment, of professional environment, in which, just to tell you very briefly, the, the most difficult thing that I still found find the most difficult thing to tackle when I work with museums, theaters, libraries. Um, professionally speaking, people working there have a very, very strong disciplinary competence. Normally, they are skilled, obviously, skilled archaeologists, art historians, librarians, and so on and so forth, but they almost always lack transversal competences such as intercultural competences. So this is where we are trying to, let's say, work. There are three principles that I want to share with you, which are the pillars of our action. The first one is Article 27 of the Declaration of Human Rights, which states that everyone has the right freely to participate in the cultural life of the community and so on and so forth. This is a right which is written in this declaration, but we all know that it's not, let's say, fully acknowledged, first of all, not to say fully realized. So that's a pillar and an objective for us. The second pillar is another document, in this case published by the Council of Europe in 2005, the Faro Convention, which represents in our sector a sort of Copernican revolution. Why? Because it states that objects and places, heritage in general, are not in themselves what is important about cultural, cultural heritage in itself. And this is already something quite hard to be shared with cultural professionals. And the second part of the sentence is that cultural heritage is important because of the meanings and uses that people attribute to it, implying that meanings are created, shaped by communities and not only by experts. And that's why it is a sort of revolutionary statement and it's not always easy to start dealing with cultural professionals on this basis. But this is it. This is where we are and this is the basis for a, a model of cultural policy which is based on cultural democracy actually. So that's the second pillar of our activity. The third one, obviously, is the White Paper on Intercultural Dialogue of 2008, which talks about the importance of intercultural dialogue in terms of preventing ethnic, religious, linguistic, and cultural divides, and focuses on democratic governance, citizenship and participation, intercultural competences that should be taught and learned at all levels in different sectors, and it also focuses in the creation of spaces for intercultural dialogue. So basically this is the, let's say, theoretical framework within which we are carrying out our activities. When I say we, I always mean ECOM, which is a multidisciplinary team formed by archaeologists such as myself, sociologists, art historians, economists, and other kinds of professional profiles, profiles. We started working in museums with this idea of intercultural dialogue and actually our, uh, the trigger for our work has been a, um, an idea developed by Jerome Clifford in 1997, museums should be contact zones, areas, spaces in which debates can take place in which different points of view, different perspectives, sorry, different opinions could be discussed. And we know that this is not always the case. Hmm? Especially in very traditional institutions, this is absolutely not the case. So it's, it's a sort of process that we are trying to activate. 
The second idea is that of Richard Sandel that we are taking as a, as a very important sort of um, basic idea for our activities. He said museums can be agents of social inclusion. Why? Because basically they, they have fostered exclusion for centuries. So now we should be able to reverse it and to have museums as agents of inclusion. How? Well, working on the uh, issue of access, cultural, physical, geographical, economic access, participation, not only in the activities, but also in the decision-making processes, representation, going beyond this divide, us and others, but allowing everybody, different cultures, different uh, groups, to be represented in cultural spaces as cultural actors and stakeholders. Well, then uh, we work a lot on audience development, which is an intercultural tool. Why? Well, because audience development, even though there are many misunderstandings about that, is not about numbers. It's not just about taking people, bringing people into museums or theaters, but it's about building bridges between cultural institutions, cultural organizations, and society as such. So for us, audience development is a strategic process which aims at widen, but also at strengthen the relationship with audiences and at diversifying audiences, meaning fostering intercultural dialogue. How do we do that? Well, we do that with activities which are strongly mission-based because it's the mission of cultural organization that needs to change in order to achieve these results. We work a lot with co-creation and co-planning activities. Capacity building, I put it in red because this is what we do mainly in terms of intercultural dialogue. We use uh, we work a lot on the use of data, trying to push for evaluation based not only on quantity, but also mainly on quality and on change. Mm -hmm. The process of change is the way we try to evaluate what's going on in, in our activities with those organizations. Of course, we couldn't work if not in strong partnership with cultural organizations and also with social organization. So transdisciplinarity, interdisciplinarity is another of our focus, focuses. We strongly believe in the need of transdisciplinarity in these kind of activities. Of course, we try to set up some sort of prerequisites before starting working with cultural organization, prerequisites which should be there, but it, this is not always the case because of what I told you before, the very, let's say, the strong uh, dis disciplinary approach that is still present, and of course it has to be present in cultural institutions. So we try to set these prerequisites or to assess these prerequisites before going into the intercultural dialogue process. I'm not going into each of them because we don't have time, but you might have read them and had a sense of what I mean. And then we start working with intercultural competences. The basis of our work is obviously the intercultural competences publication by UNESCO of 2013 and the intercultural tree, which we use as a model, but obviously we try to adapt it to the different organizations and contexts we are working with. This is a list of projects we have been involved in, and of course I'm not going into details here. You can find all of them on our website, and of course I'll be, able, I'll be happy also to discuss them with you if you want to do it in the next days or even months, why not? 
But this is just to tell you that we have been working with intercultural dialogues since 2012. Some of them have been funded by the Lifelong Learning Program. Others have been funded by other programs, by Creative Europe, for example, meaning that European Union is trying to foster this issue of intercultural competences not only through programs traditionally dedicated to education, but also through programs which are addressing cultural issues as such, such as Creative Europe, for example. And one of these projects uh, ended up uh, with a publication which is an intercultural dictionary we published it in Italian, English, and Arabic, and we are now working on a new edition of it, which will be published in 2022. So this is also to, to tell you that we try to give and leave traces of what we do through documents, books, publications, in order not only to disseminate, but to share, to better share our experiences in this very specific field. I will stop here. This is my email address because obviously, as usual, I forgot all my cards. So if you want to get in touch with me, this is the only way <laughs> for the moment, for the time being. I'll be more than happy to keep on discussing these issues with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christina, for this overview and for sharing your experience with us. Uh, you have such a rich experience, so it was really interesting to, to listen to you. And now I will move to Pina Sodano. Pina Sodano is a researcher at the University of Roma 3. She is specialized in uh, intercultural dialogue, inclusion, integration of migrants. So she's working also with different migrant communities. And she works also at the Consorzio Meucci Ruini. Uh, being in charge of different projects. So based on her experience, uh, we asked her to tell us a little bit more about this, um, this link between culture, arts, and the integration of migrants and refugees. So how can we use culture and arts as a tool to integrate migrants and refugees? Pina, thank you so much. The floor is yours. Let's see if we have your PowerPoint presentation. No, 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 it's okay. <laughs> thank you. I will uh, just take, uh, uh, um, uh, let's say, an invitation by Santos, uh, we say before. We, use, we used to talk about academic point of view. Today I would like to uh, show you not just uh, a perspective from uh, academic, uh, but uh, a concrete, real project that uh, I'm working with my association and in this case, I'm uh, represented, uh, this association is called Tempi Moderni. And uh, with this association, uh, we work, we had the, the possibility to work uh, uh, with uh, an important project uh, that is called the Hand of Respect. What is a Tempi Moderni Association? Uh, Tempi Moderni Association is a, a study center. We are, um, a very big uh, uh, member of this association that are uh, coming from uh, academic, uh, coming from uh, over the world, and uh, journalists and artists. So uh, the, the, the core business of our associ association is to work in collaboration and cooperation with all these fields. Um, so not just uh, acad <laughs> academic, but uh, concrete. So uh, we had uh, the opportunity, thanks to uh, uh, an, um, collaboration with uh, other uh, partners that then we will sh I will show you, uh, to work about this project. Why Hand of uh, Respect? Because uh, we work especially in the south of Italy with a community called, uh, that is coming from uh, Punjab, the Sikh community, uh, there are men and women that are working in the fields, uh, in the 
agriculture field. So you can imagine how much hard is uh, uh, working uh, during the winter and during the summer. And uh, so what we uh, thinking about to involve them, not just uh, working with the human rights, because of course uh, our uh, business core is uh, uh, working with them, uh, uh, telling them about uh, um, the, the rights they have in, during the work, you see, because uh, we know how much uh, hard is the situation for women and men that are working in the agriculture field. They work more than nine or eight hours in the day. So uh, we try to involve them with another project uh, that was uh, more, let's say, uh, cultural, but not, uh, I mean, art, our view of art, you see. So, the one, the, this sculpture that you have, you can see, is made by hand. These hands are from real workers and that they work in the field, you see? So we, uh, during uh, um, a workshop, we told them that we, we, were, we were planning to, to make this sculpture, you see? And so we asked them to give uh, this hand for testimony that they work, so they become, uh, let's say, our uh, model, uh, our uh, um, model. model, so for this uh, sculpture. So, um, thanks to the proposal of the Italian Association of the Business Commission and uh, other departments, both by Spartan the world, Mama Roma and the Pet Tom, and Tom said, thanks to as a testimony of uh, what is going on to the uh, campaign uh, near to this city, you see? And we chose another uh, important, we chose an important place that is the uh, station, uh, bus station uh, place because we want that all people that uh, uh, pass by this uh, place can see so they will not say we don't know that you see because uh, sometimes while we used to go to schools and to talk about uh, cultural uh, the, the importance of uh, welcoming I prefer to say welcoming in state of integration of our community that live in uh, our uh, country they will uh, not say, okay, I, don't, uh, I didn't know that what this happened on? near to my house, near to my place of work, and so on. So for us, uh, uh, it was important, uh, these uh, hands of respect for different meaning, of, of course. The first one, uh, to let uh, those people to be real part of a uh, uh, a sculpture, so they uh, put their hand, and in the other hand, <laughs> we um, push too much about this project because we want to show through the beauty, through the importance of uh, the art, our society, our, our society now. Uh, so. Um, what else? I will try. I don't know if I have uh, more time. And so, uh, of course, our society uh, working uh, about, uh, uh, as I told you before, human rights, in particular in the worker uh, and the labor fields, but not only. Now we have 
we are working in a new project. I just want to tell you because uh, if you want to know more about uh, the, the association and what we uh, work in about, you can go to this um, website uh, about another project that for us is very important because it's a, um, a place where women, especially women, uh, come to tell us uh, about their experience. Uh, of course, uh, uh, most of them are very bad experience uh, in, during the war. So we try to help them with the psychological support and uh, giving them some uh, um, course of Italian because of course, as you know, another important point uh, uh, for them is the fact that they don't speak very well Italian and also not very well English, so we have uh, some mediation with uh, some uh, of the community that help us to be, let's say, uh, our mediator. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, we support them also, taking them in a security place where they can live uh, and uh, they can start a new life, uh, a new better life, of course. Thank you. Thank yeah, you welcome. so much, Pina, for your work and for sharing with us uh, your experience. I think it's really important also to raise the awareness on what is going on in our society, of course, using tools such as arts and culture. So thank you, Cristina. Thank you, Pina. And now I would like to uh, ask Gaetano, Gaetano Giura and Enrico Messinese to join me here. Thank you so much, uh, Gaetano and Enrico, for being here. Um, I will start with Gaetano. Gaetano Giura uh, is a filmmaker and a producer. He's also the founder of Tanino Films. Uh, he recently produced uh, a docu-film on the future of Europe. And it was really not just a movie, it was really an experience, a project, because he accompanied, uh, he was together with a group of young European people in search for a new Europe. Uh, on the island of uh, Ventotene, uh, which is the island where Altiero Spinelli, one of the founding fathers of Europe, imagined a united and free Europe while he was confined there during the fascism. So I think uh, it's really, uh, what, what I find very interesting is uh, this idea to use this kind of art uh, to communicate also uh, important messages and values and to promote a reflection on uh, our current uh, challenges, uh, also involving uh, the younger generation because, you know, this is m maybe a powerful uh, tool, a more powerful tool also to engage uh, people and to make more, uh, they more active. So Gaetano, I will ask you to maybe share with us a little bit more about your experience uh, and uh, what the movie uh, represented to you. Thanks. Sure. First of all, thank you very much, uh, Loredana and the Instituto Luigi Sturza for inviting me. And as you were saying, I am a director. I'm quite young, as you can tell, probably in spite, if, even though I look 14, I'm 27, so I reassure you on that. And I started working on this documentary now over two years ago, and me and the crew and the activists that worked on this documentary really tried to uh, look for, different, different pers for a different perspective, let's say. Um, so I brought a little clip, actually, a little promo uh, for the documentary, which I'd like to show you uh, to begin with in order to kind of like explain and show you what Vento Tene looks like, first of all. Nel mezzo del cammino di nostra vita, mi ritrovai a Vento Tene. In quegli anni, in quel luogo, nacque una seconda volta. Era un luogo di segregazione e eh, di isolamento che invece è stato il luogo propulsivo di un'idea di Europa libera e unita. C'è di più piccolo o più grande. Quindi si parla di qualche centinaio di abitanti in questa isola, se la si prende anche in 1941 o 1945, e siamo a 560 milioni di mondo che chiede di un'Europa più forte. Naturalmente lo sguardo deve essere rivolto ai giovani, perché saranno loro i protagonisti. We are every country, 
we are a small plenary. Se da quelle nascono movimenti che hanno massa consistente, massa sufficiente per incontrarsi e scontrarsi con le direzioni politiche, potrebbe anche da questo punto di vista avviarsi una stagione nuova per l'Europa. I am convinced that Europe can shape this new world if it works together and rediscovers its pioneering spirit. And for this, I want to cite a sentence from the Ventotene Manifesto. Oggi è il momento in cui bisogna saper gettare via vecchi fardelli, tenersi pronti al nuovo che sopraggiunge così diverso da tutto quello che si era immaginato. Dear friends, this moment has arrived once again. So we pretty much went looking for Europe in that sense. I did not send the picture before about culture, but I, I think this is enough in that sense. Um, so when we talk about cinema, TV, or any kind of visual medium for that matter, we are talking about stories. So that's not necessarily history, but we're talking about actual stories with um, characters, themes, antagonists, heroes, and villains in that sense. And what fascinated me most about uh, Ventotene, which is a very small island in the middle of nowhere in the, in the Mediterranean Sea, and it's also the main protagonist of my documentary, it's not necessarily only its history, but it's, most of all, its extremely important story. So three men, Altiero Spinelli, Eugenio Colori, and Ernesto Rossi, were confined on this island because of their so-called dangerous ideas by the fascist regime. And instead of closing on themselves, what they started doing is that they wrote um, a manifesto which turned out one of the inspiring documents for one of the largest corporations in the world. So they were looking towards the future rather than just thinking of the darkness that was surrounding them. So this is mainly a plot for, it could easily be the plot of a movie or documentary such as mine. And so stories and therefore ideas in that sense are extremely important and impactful. And often, especially these days, we are very focused on our daily life and on our personal um, aspects and how it goes and how we are walking around, what we have to do. And I've, everyone that has lived in London, as I have for over six years, knows what I'm talking about. And in that sense, art has been used and consumed as pure escap escapism. So as a way of distracting ourselves from our daily life. But visual storytelling and therefore cinema and therefore TV and any other different kind is a tool, as you were saying, Loredana, before, to be able to look at different perspectives, to be able to look at the future and at what we once were and what we could be. So through my work on this documentary, um, Cercando Europa, I noticed that the history and the story of Ventotene was mostly forgotten in that sense whether it was from Italians, Italian institutions, or outside of Italy. I mean, I worked in, in London for a BBC production company, and my boss, that was the former head of uh, current affairs, they don't, they don't know anything about it, but that's, that's fine, he knows now, let's say. And even, it's just ironic that European institutions and politicians also ignore this story, because of course the main building of the European Parliament is dedicated to Altiero Spinelli, but inside, there's no mention whatsoever of the island that helped form, uh, form him and his ideas in regards of, of the European Union. But every time that I, that I narrated this story to people, whether it was uh, investors, potential interviewees, or just friends, I noticed they were extremely fascinated by it. And not only because um, I presented it to them as a fundamental part of our European history, but most of all, because of its story, because of what happened there, and because of people such as Altiero Spinelli that started there and started talking with each other and come up with new ideas for what the future could look like. Well, I spoke to many uh, European activists through this process, and I noticed that the more that I told them about the story, the more they felt fascinated by it. And most than fascinated, it seemed like they were called to go to Ventotene. And I can tell you that I, I'm still in contact with all the, the activists, and it seems like the Ventotene experience has changed 
their perspective on the European Union in a way. And because Ventotene, it turns out, it's a very incredibly small island, as I've said many times, and as you've seen from the, from the trailer, but it's, it's an incredibly magical place. And it's a place that it's completely suspended in time, and it's full of interesting uh, stories, whether they're to do with the manifesto or not. Because as a matter of fact, just in front of the island of Ventotene, there's another island, which is called Santo Stefano. And on this island, there is nothing, pretty much, except for an abandoned prison. So this prison uh, represented for many, many years um, a place where the different regimes would send their people that were sentenced to, li uh, to life sentence, or otherwise the most dangerous kind of politicians. And uh, one of them was Sandro Bertini, uh, of course very important in our uh, Italian history. And so what happened there in, in 1950s, let's say what happened is that um, an incredibly progressive prison director arrived on the island and they started taking a different kind of um, approach towards the life in the prison itself. So they started implying more human and open way, open policies towards the life of the prisoners. And one of these things has been um, the constructions of a football field, which seems quite odd for, for a prison at the time, especially one that is completely isolated in the middle of the, um, of the Mediterranean Sea. Well, that place that is now the home for many, many seagulls, and if you try to be there, you could potentially be attacked by them, I've tried, it's, it kind of has inspired me to write a movie about it. So, a story about emotions, human and civil rights. So this is just to tell you how two very small islands in the middle of nowhere have the opportunity and the possibility to inspire and to inspire stories in that sense. So the role of cinema in the end, and again, of any kind of visual medium, is to be able to find the best ways to convey these stories to a wider audience. And well, it could be through, um, through a very interesting plot, it could be through three-dimensional characters, but also through beautiful cinematography, because in the end, both um, substance and style have to collaborate in order to enhance the stories that a specific filmmaker wants to tell in that specific moment. And it doesn't matter whether it's a, a big Hollywood movie with plenty of superheroes or if it's just a story that is told from the perspective of, um, of an iPhone in that sense. Because cinema is an incredibly powerful visual storytelling medium, which is truly able to capture any kind of audience, to carry out any kind of message, and most of all, to open up people to new ideas and unknown stories in that sense. So this is what I tried to do uh, with the documentary and try to bring to people this, the Bento Tennis story, but that's what many filmmakers do with their own, uh, with their own movies. Because if we only stay focused on our own personal understanding of life, on our own personal point of views, and perhaps even inside our own borders, we will never be able to truly open up our minds, grow and progress. And cinema and visual storytelling are a very direct and extremely accessible source of exploration. And in a sense, filmmakers are like modern day explorers that are just looking, as I did for, with, for, with the documentary, for um, new cultures, uh, new point of views, new worlds, and different stories that we don't usually tend to hear, as uh, the one that Pina was mentioning about before, about the Sikh community in, in Latina, which is stories that we don't often know, but through art, through cinema, and through visual storytelling, we are able to explore, let's say. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm, you know, I'm really fascinated by, by your work and how you are telling stories through these powerful uh, images and, and films. So thank you very much for sharing with us your experience. And now I will move to Enrico Messinese on another dimension, uh, let's say the, the, the learning one, uh, because Enrico is a project manager at CHAPE, uh, the Italian Permanent Learning Center. Uh, CHAPE carries out training activities to develop and validate soft skills. Uh, as well as competencies required specifically um, in the future labor market and in the cultural sector. 
so Enrico, we are all curious to learn more about it. I will leave you the floor. Okay. Uh, thank you, Verdana. Uh, let me add uh, my thank you to the Regis Tuts uh, Foundation, the partners of the Art Connection Project to, to, to invite me here today and uh, uh, to present to you uh, one of, of our most recent projects. We closed this project uh, at the end of uh, August. This year, uh, after, uh, well, I, I don't want uh, to, to, to tell you all the, the, uh, the difficulties caused by the, the pandemic, but uh, uh, we uh, finally managed to close uh, this project. This, the project is called HICO, Heritage Valorization for Local Communities. Uh, it was made in partnership with another Italian partners, which is Anci Lazio, the uh, Association of National Municipalities uh, in Italy, but uh, uh, li limited to, to the, the municipalities of the, the Lazio region, and other partners from uh, um, Slovenia, Malta, the Netherlands, and Lithuania. Uh, well, uh, the project is, uh, well, it was about uh, how to uh, valorize how to use and give a new use to the heritage uh, in order to, to, to build social cohesion, uh, new identities of places, uh, new identities, identities for communities. Uh, and in order to do this, uh, we uh, uh, thought that uh, heritage is not enough. As uh, Cristina da Milano was saying before, uh, it, 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 heritage, the, the place, the, 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 is not enough itself. It is necessary to invest uh, on new skills, new competencies, and uh, especially for the project, uh, our target group uh, uh, was the, those responsibles uh, the operators of museums, libraries, uh, public spaces uh, that in, in, with, the, with, the, uh, with the role of managing the heritage uh, and watching at the specific, the small villages, the small uh, municipalities. Uh, what we did, uh, of course, uh, being an Erasmus Plus project, we uh, travel and we uh, visit each other uh, towns and, and places and uh, in order to uh, touch uh, what uh, uh, the different partners uh, um, was making in order to, um, to manage the heritage, to, to, to be uh, always uh, uh, Dated in terms of skills, in terms of activities. Um, what we found is that uh, it, it doesn't matter uh, how distant you are in Europe, uh, how different is your uh, story, history, or communities, uh, there are similar problems in this field. Uh, it is necessary to invest on skills and competencies uh, uh, for example, um, the, um, the partners uh, visiting uh, the Italian reality uh, managed to better understand what uh, um, working in network means. For example, uh, there are very uh, there are other other examples in Europe. For example, in, in Lithuania. Uh, they uh, make some partnership, but uh, um, uh, since the, 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 the village is uh, really small and they, uh, they have the fortune to, to, to receive a lot of uh, money, a lot of public funds, uh, sometimes these funds are uh, direct uh, um, invested in, uh, in projects uh, uh, the, um, they decide. With, with, the, with the founder, with the donors. Uh, so uh, for, for them uh, is quite new uh, how to uh, 
uh, find the partners uh, on the territory and build the activity together. Uh, something uh, we, uh, we, um, we found, uh, other, other kind of uh, competencies is uh, creativity. Uh, we found that in Italy we uh, lack sometimes in creativity. Uh, we are doing always the same thing. We cannot uh, really uh, read. Uh, well, maybe uh, we uh, sometimes uh, lack the capacity of really understand the needs and then transform it into a practical activity, a practical project. Uh, so, uh, in this sense, the, the, the partner from the Netherlands, which is uh, a university, uh, gave very, very interesting inputs in doing this, uh, giving us and to, to the target group uh, really uh, very easy uh, tools, uh, but very powerful in terms of uh, uh, engagement and participation. Uh, at, uh, in the end, uh, what we found is that working with uh, culture, with heritage, is uh, uh, not only uh, a way to build and to uh, enhance social cohesion and participation and identities of communities, but uh, it, can, it can have an impact also on uh, uh, economy. Uh, new collaboration can transform in new partnership uh, uh, between the, the public and the private sector, for example, uh, uh, as well between museums and enterprises. Uh, it can give the, 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 the way to, to, to new services and uh, uh, multimedia product, for example, and these uh, involve uh, again uh, another kind of um, competencies, uh, ICT, di digital transformation, uh, which is uh, the future. Yeah, sometimes it uh, sounds strange to, to link uh, something very ancient, uh, something very old, like uh, probably this room. You can see frescoes, you can see uh, the, the history here inside but uh, uh, probably here you can build something that uh, can uh, involve virtual reality. Probably uh, we are watching now something that uh, looks really different uh, uh, about the, the past centuries. So why not to, uh, to use these tools that today are uh, available, for example. Um, Going to the end, because I know that the time is very strict, uh, um, another um, impact is about uh, the function of the, of the, of the place, of the, of the heritage. So uh, it's necessary to invest about new coordination skills, new programming, watching uh, at the future, and uh, um, again, another thing, um, while the, the project was running, uh, is that uh, uh, now with the next generation new uh, Italy, for example, we receive a lot of funds to invest in culture and to, to adapt culture and invest on, on, on tourism, for example. Uh, so um, when, we, when we started the project, we were thinking just about uh, um, yes, skills, communication, creativity, sustainability, and Going on, uh, the, um, well, the, the surrounding uh, impact on the project. So it, it is something that uh, we read in two ways. Uh, not only what the project can impact uh, uh, on, on the, on the, um, uh, in the framework, but also as the framework can impact. Uh, so uh, the, the, the new, the, um, possibility to, to receive these funds uh, gave us the opportunity also to discuss uh, uh, about other things not, uh, uh, not initially 
pre prevented, not initially. You know. So this is our experience. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Enrico, for sharing your, uh, for your experience. I actually think that we do not lack creativity, but we are not encouraged to use it because yes. this is also my experience uh, within this project. So I'm not used to tell stories with images or just drawing something. And they were encouraging me to do it because we did some kind of exercise also within ourselves. And that was, that was uh, a nice experience for me. So I thought at the beginning, no, I'm not creative at all. And then suddenly <laughs> you are pushed to do it and you, you understand that you can communicate also in other ways. So thank you very much. Uh, and now um, we already have such a rich picture. Uh, I would like to invite Professor Giuditta Alessandrini to join me here on the stage. And in the meantime, we have a short video made by Paola Santoro, uh, who unfortunately is not here with us, but she's uh, a trainer of Arci Servizio Civile, uh, the biggest organization in Italy implementing projects of uh, civil service. Uh, so she's uh, telling us a little bit more on of how uh, they are uh, engaging uh, young volunteers in the cultural heritage sector. So uh, active citizenship, uh, volunteering, and, uh, and culture. Good morning, everybody. I'm very pleased to be with you today. Uh, thanks to the Instituto Sturzo for inviting us to participate and bring uh, our experience. My name is uh, Paola Santoro and I'm here on behalf of Arci Servizio Civile. I'm going to briefly uh, guide you through who we are and uh, uh, our experience in the soft skills uh, validation. Arci Servizio Civile is an association of social promotion and is the largest in Italy completely dedicated to uh, civic service. Uh, as you can see from the slide, we started the, the experience uh, uh, since the conscientious objectors and we still run nowadays with volunteers. Uh, at this very moment, we got more than 2,300 volunteers involved in uh, our projects all over Italy and in uh, different sectors, as you can see from the table. In 2019, we ran a pilot project the announcement of civics and soft skills of volunteer workers in the um, civic service. So I'm going to try to explain you uh, what this project was about. First of all, the, the steps. Uh, we ran through several steps. The first one was the training of the tutor, and I will explain you better uh, who the tutor is. Then the process of identification, assessment and uh, the recognition of, uh, of the skills of each volunteers, and then a step three, the validation request sent to, to the University of Roma 3, and a step four, the research. Those the details of the project, we involved 10 of our uh, local association on the Italian territory, as you can see in the map, the green, uh, green parts, uh, we trained 17 tutors and we involved 63 volunteers. First step, the tutor's training. It was a very important stage. Uh, the tutors have been involved in uh, different uh, learning acti training activities and learning activities. Uh, some online uh, hours, then uh, workshops, simulation, and in the end, the practice with the volunteers involved in the pilot project. At the end of this training, the tutors took an exam at the University of Roma 3 to receive their certificate of, uh, as an ex as expert in the identification, transparency, and validation of skills. Um, I would like to underline the importance uh, of this product, project, not just for the volunteers involved, who so at the end, uh, uh, their skill recognized, but also for all the world of adults spinning around the project, because I guess that uh, I can say, I can see, I can say, sorry, actually, that uh, all of us, we, we grew up in, in this project. 
here briefly the, the skills area we've been focusing in, so social skills, personal skills, civic area, intercultural, learn to learn and communication. The method we use, uh, you, I think, is a very crucial part of the project. So we use the autobiographical interviews, which were um, fundamental to create uh, an interpersonal relationship between volunteers and uh, tutors. And uh, it was the narrative part, it was the storytelling, uh, very important because it helped the volunteers to, uh, to express, to go through, to deeper their story and put in order um, things that uh, sometimes uh, uh, we hardly also take uh, time to reflect on. Then there was uh, the guided writing. We prepared some documents, some tools, in order to, uh, to guide the, um, the analysis uh, of the volunteers. So those papers were uh, full of questions and tables to fill, uh, but it was not just filling, filling a paper. Those papers were studied and uh, constructed in a way that helped the volunteers to watch their um, experience, their path, their, their lives completely through different perspectives and um, focusing not just on formal learning but also in uh, the whole life experiences which means from the volunteers to the hobbies and then to those uh, uh, experiences considered very important uh, which can be the journey you, you always dream, dreamt about or uh, um, the meeting of the love of your life or your friendship with someone uh, so really 360 degrees and also we use a digital platform to exchange those documents so the role of the tutor was uh, really really important I said before it was crucial uh, because it was the mm, the other the other I'm talking to and uh, that helps me to see myself better that's why I describe it as a mirror so the, the tutor is not, is not a judge, is not someone who's going to say to me, ah, you got this skill or you got this other one. No, he's going to just help me through questions and analysis to, to, to deeper my uh, understanding of, of myself in terms of uh, skills. And also it, it, has, it had the role of uh, supporting during, different, during difficulties of the path. The volunteers because sometimes you know you stumble on on some parts of your life story that are crucial difficult and so the tutor has this uh, also role to to push to empower to to help to go through uh, as i said uh, we, we focus on each volunteer so it was not about uh, filling a form with yes or not got it i don't have it uh, yet but it was really uh, make the volunteers conscious, aware of, uh, of their whole experiences and uh, the, the skills they, they are already, they were already uh, putting in, uh, in place. And uh, awareness is, uh, is a key word of this process. Then, step three, validation. So, of the 63 volunteers, 54 reached the end of the, of the process, of the, of the course, and they sent their request to the University of Roma 3. Uh, the request was a document supported by proof, so they had also to collect proof of the skills they were claiming, and uh, the commission made of uh, the representative of the, of the three organizations who took part uh, to the project plus INAP um, examined the, the, the request and uh, all of them that had the, the skills validated. The step four was the research and uh, these are my conclusions. The research showed that uh, the process really helped those volunteers involved in uh, become more aware of the potential of the power of the skills they got. Uh, some of them also recognize uh, uh, the point they had to work in a mo more on to, to improve. Uh, they become more aware of uh, 
the acting inside your, inside your organization and they become more aware of their civic action, uh, which is uh, very, very important. Uh, the volunteers are involved in different fields from, uh, from projects that are with minors, with elders, uh, projects um, into the environment, taking care of the, of the environment, or project taking care of the, the cultural heritage. So really different projects, but all of them, they got uh, the same um, outcome, taking care, protect uh, uh, our communities. And this was a really um, a good focus we've done with, uh, with all the volunteers. So nowadays, those, uh, those volunteers involved, young men and women, they are um, aware, um, they are aware of the human capital they, they, they got in themselves, which uh, will help them to, uh, to face life after the civic service, to go into this uh, global and fluid world outside, uh, with more awareness and empowered by this experience. I thank all of you for listening and um, I will leave the contacts uh, if you have any question. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much, Paola. We are working together in this project with volunteers, so it was, uh, I think it was important also to listen to this experience. And now uh, our last uh, contribution is from uh, Professor Giuditta Alessandrini. Uh, professor Alessandrini is a full senior professor of social pedagogy and pedagogy of work at the University of Roma 3, and she's also a member of the Secretariat of ASVIS, uh, which is the Italian Alliance for Sustainable Development. It's an alliance consisting of almost 300 associations and organizations of the civil society dealing with the UN 2030 Agenda and the Sustainable Goals. So she will highlight a little bit what is this link between culture, the UN 2030 Agenda and sustainability. And so I will leave her uh, the conclusive remarks as well. Thank you. Thank you, Professor, for being here. Thanks. Um, uh, good morning. Good evening <laughs> is better. And I, I am very happy to stay here because I collaborated in the past uh, to Project CREAM, <laughs> I see before and also because in this uh, uh, fabulous room <laughs> I presented some books in the past. <laughs> and uh, I appreciated uh, uh, your project because I read some things and also now I participate at the conference. It's very, very interesting, your project, because um, uh, the culture, I think, in this moment, uh, in this moment, uh, is the future. Is the future is the peace. Uh, um, the culture uh, now, also in in the um, in the, this season of post-pandemic uh, crisis, is very, very important way to construct democracy. To contrast a true education, it's very, very important. Um, my, the focus of my speech is um, the relationship from sustainability and culture. And I, I the, the uh, one of, of um, uh, speaker before uh, underlined this, uh, this point. It's very, very important. Um, I think that. Uh, you know very, very well the framework of Agenda uh, 2030. Uh, and you can see in this slide uh, some topics, but very synthetically, <laughs> of my speech. Uh, let me begin uh, uh, with uh, a word of uh, Gutierrez. Uh, it's very, very important, this sentence. Uh, culture is a powerful source of identity and uh, of resilience. Resilience is, is a very important attitude and competence in this moment of post-pandemic uh, crisis. Um, the framework of agenda, I, I believe that is uh, very, very clear for uh, each, uh, each of, uh, of, uh, uh, of people in this room. 
But I think it's important also to underline some value, some value of framework of agenda. For example, the meaning of education as a public good. This is a very important value. And also is uh, important for equity, for equity. Uh, education uh, as a key factor for sustainability. Now there is a very great work uh, from uh, um, uh, ASVIS, Alliance for uh, uh, Sustainable Agenda, and now is beginning also the festival, the festival of uh, uh, sustainable development, a very important festival. I don't know if Sturzo is uh, yes. one of the members. Ah, um, uh, there, uh, there is a um, panel of uh, 40 other events now in Italy, in Italy, not, not only in Rome, about uh, these uh, uh, goals, this opportunity. And also the social inclusion is uh, another very, very important value. And uh, uh, also the contrast uh, the, to poverty, to exclusion. Uh, as this, uh, is this, I don't know if it is a pronunciation, a correct pronunciation, uh, in Italy is very, very important because it's in a, an unique experience of Italy, unique experience in Europe, as this. Um, the president was uh, Enrico Giovannini, now is uh, one of the ministers of this government, Draghi, and the uh, Italian Alliance for Sustainable Development brings together uh, almost uh, three, uh, 300 member organizations, in which there is also Sturzo, among the civil society. Um, there are firms, there are public sector, there are also, uh, also university, the RUS, the network of university for sustainability, and uh, is implementing also the, this number. It's a very, very important uh, uh, opportunity. It's a very network. A strange network because there are very different members, but it's very important in, in this moment to promote the culture, the philosophy of sustainability. Um, the culture, culture, <laughs> what is culture is no, is a very, is a rhetoric, perhaps it's a rhetoric question, but it is important because culture is not, uh, uh, um, uh, the, is also, is also, emotional features that characterize like community. It's very, very clear also in this conference. I, I, I read a very interesting relation. And also, also for the right, fundamental right, human right, human right. Um, which is the role of culture in the next digat? Um, I think that this project, uh, and see, there are two projects, <laughs> the project of Sturzo, uh, of uh, network uh, in this, uh, of, in this uh, seminar, is very important to clear the role of culture in the future. Culture is essential for the achievement of all goals of Agenda 2030, for all goals. An explicit presence of culture in the action of delivery effort to achieve the SDG is more essential than ever. A culture is an enable to help community thrive and be sustainable. Uh, there is uh, also the need uh, to localization of culture. Culture localization is the as one of the SDG important, because we need to translate the universal language of uh, SDG into the individual and collective lives of citizens inhabiting specific community, cities, and region. This is very important because the goals, uh, the, the frame of goals is uh, worldwide, but uh, we need to 
translating in uh, the Italian culture, European culture, and etc. Uh, it's important also the issue of dignity because cultural practice convey form of, of expression, creativity and identity building, identity building that relate to the core of human dignity. And this is very, very important. The dignity is related to uh, human right, human right. Also the dignity in the work. Uh, I remember the uh, eighth goal about the decent work, the decent work also in the environment, uh, environment of culture. Uh, there is also the issue of active citizenship. Active citizenship is defined from European Commission uh, like uh, the possible participation of citizens in all sphere of social and economic life. This is very, very important, the involvement of uh, citizens. Um, uh, social cohesion, I remember also so before many speakers uh, talk about this, uh, social cohesion is very important because it related with the educational policies promoting individuals. Uh, social cohesion and active citizenship are very, very uh, related with culture, with, implement, with to, opportunity to implement culture. Um, so there is a, another very important issue uh, that is uh, uh, um, the relation between different generations. Also, at this point, also here before, uh, we, we discussed uh, about this, uh, this point, is very important. It's one of the educational goals also uh, of diversity. You talk about uh, gender diversity, but also generational diversity. It's important to connect uh, the uh, different diversity. Uh, in this slide, it's possible to, to see la, as uh, in the future, uh, the less young is uh, increasing <laughs> and uh, uh, the world uh, was of uh, not young, <laughs> but, uh, uh, but uh, old people, I don't know. Um, it's important to balance uh, the, the role of the of generation uh, uh, with very, very um, uh, different methodology. For example, the reverse mentoring. The reverse mentoring is very important. Also in, the, in some firms, uh, uh, you use this uh, opportunity, methodolo methodological opportunity to create a, a, a authentic discussion, a, a authentic uh, opportunity to learn to learn from uh, uh, people of different age. Also about the technology environment, uh, I think uh, I, I'm, uh, at the world of ICT. <laughs> um, you can see now uh, uh, the relation about a single uh, uh, single uh, goals and cultural evidence. For example, uh, uh, SDG then about reducing inequalities. This is very important. Uh, fundamental goals, reducing inequality. Uh, another example is uh, gender equality. I talked before about gender equality uh, is uh, a, a very urgent, important um, objective to realize because the women uh, are penalized, uh, uh, suffer, the women in, in uh, every country for pandemic crisis suffers. And the, uh, the young and women are individual who have um, um, the problem, the problem, very, very, very important. Also, uh, SDG 4 
the integration of the arts and cultural knowledge, diversity and creativity can be seen as integral to inclusive education. Uh, for, uh, this SDG 4, the goal 4 is the education for the education of quality, quality of education. And uh, 5 and 4 are very important goals uh, of uh, agenda. I think uh, perhaps more important goals. Uh, so also library, museum, and community, and cultural centers can be, um, can be uh, seen as a basic service. SDG 1. Uh, cultural facilities may also be seen as part of a resilient and the quality of infrastructure, SDG 9. Uh, also, uh, the cultural heritage, but we have before discussed uh, a lot, and the partnership for the goals uh, uh, for international and cultural collaboration, another SDG. We can see that uh, there are very, very uh, um, uh, important connections about uh, sustainability and Agenda 2030, uh, which are uh, open questions. There are many, many open questions. <laughs> but I would like to focalize uh, uh, three uh, open questions. First, uh, how is possible to accelerate implementation? <laughs> because 2030 is now. <laughs> Is now. Uh, second, as well as to prepare for an enhanced reflection of culture in future global agenda of sustainable development, uh, because the climate change is dan dan very dangerous in this moment, this day, we, every day we, we had <laughs> some terrible news. Uh, third, third how develop partnership at local, national, regional, and global level to work with public authorities, uh, civil society, and community to strengthen the integration of the cultural dimension of the SDG. The partnership is a fundamental opportunity to organize a new, uh, a new view, a new view. And, uh, the project, Erasmus project, are a good example of this partnership. Uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, you uh, work in a very important direction <laughs> uh, uh, about uh, the uh, issue of cultural, cultural uh, uh, implementation. Thanks for uh, uh, attention and good work for the member of the network. <laughs> thank you, thank you so much, Professor, for, for highlighting such a, such a wide uh, picture. And now I would like really to thank all my friends, all the partners uh, of our project, uh, all the speakers who accepted our invitation and shared their experience, and all the listeners. So uh, we really engaged you in, uh, a, com in, in a debate and a reflection uh, over two hours, so I know it was a lot, but uh, uh, I also know that we are leaving uh, this event with a lot of thought, food for thought and uh, with many questions. Uh, I would like to add a, a final one, uh, which is something that we are asking ourselves uh, during the project. Uh, what does it mean, in the end, being cultural competent? And with that question in mind, uh, thank you once again, and let's discuss this also after the conference, and let's definitely keep in touch. Thank you very much.